Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hello out there in Streamland. <laughs> I'm Joanna Fabicon. I'm the Senior Librarian of Children's Services for the Los Angeles Public Library. And welcome to our first session of Ask an Author. Um, just some business and logistics out of the way. We are open for our chat and questions throughout their session. And um, nothing very formal at all. It's just going to be a fun conversation with our author and fellow interviewer librarian here today. So let me go ahead and introduce who is here. Um, first, we have Lauren Kratz, the children's librarian at Studio City Branch Library for LAPL. Lauren is amazing at all of these kinds of events. She does a ton of programs with her community and kids. They have a lot of science programs, um, junior reporter programs, um, author visits, book clubs. It's amazing. And then our author today, author and storyteller Cornelia Funke. Welcome. Everyone, she's best known at, for as the author of the Ink Heart Trilogy, but then I just realized, oh, and also the Dragon Rider series, and also the Mirror World, <laughs> and, also, and also so many wonderful books. So we are so glad to have you here today, Cornelia. I am so glad to be here. And, and of course, at this moment, we're like, oh, I wish I could sit in their libraries and see your libraries. I know. Another time. <laughs> Another time, yes. <laughs> Another time. This is as close as we can get. So I'm glad. Absolutely. We're glad. Yes. All right. So yeah, again, <laughs> anyone will be monitoring the chat and questions. So whenever you hear something or you have a question, go ahead and type that in. We'll just go ahead and get started. <laughs> okay. Okay, Cornelia. <laughs> my first question for you is in Inkheart. Mm -hmm. Maggie, anytime she needs to summon up her courage, there's a situation in the story, mm -hmm. and she needs to summon up her courage herself or her father, Mo. They always remember a character or a book like Huck Finn, and they mm -hmm. summon up the courage. And why did you do that in your stories? What are you hoping that your readers get from reading those passages? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't even think. I do think like that when I'm writing a story. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I'm mostly so in the story that I don't wonder, hmm, what will that make my readers think? Mm -hmm. That often comes when I'm in conversations with my readers or when I hear back from it. But I cannot really say that while I'm writing it, I always think of the effect, which I think is sometimes also good. It is something that is profoundly me because I used to go to my library with my father on foot over two bridges it was my sister <laughs> as a child and we both came back with treasure you know always forgot we don't have a car we're walking back so we each came back with a pile and my library was the left was a children's section the right was the adult section and so i went to the left my father to the right and then we at the end met with our treasure <laughs> so i think most of maggie and Mo comes mm -hmm. from my relationship with my father and, and our library adventures. I love how the library is incorporated into that. And books are treasures. Yes. <laughs> and it, the wonderful thing is that library for a while was empty mm -hmm. and not used. And now my little hometown in Germany made it into a children's cultural center because wow. it was my favorite library. I called it the tree house because it had a spiral staircase. So it's very wonderful to, you know, to see how the different times of your life then come together and create something really beautiful. Wow. So you talk about how the library um, sort of inspired that. Are there other locations that, that you remember or have made the same impact in your work and writing? Well, and interestingly, Inkheart is a good example for that, as is the sea plot, but let's start with Inkheart. Um, okay. Of course, it is set in Liguria, which is the north of Italy. And mm -hmm. I stayed there with my family for three months and found it always to be such a strange mix of touristic beaches and very old and often abandoned villages in the mountains. So part of that inspired Inkheart, of course. And uh, then, of course, my obsession with books and libraries <laughs> and, um, and book binding and all of it. With the sea floor, it was one visit to Venice. 
where I thought, oh, you don't have to always tell people about magical places they can't really go to. Like, they sadly can't go to Hogwarts unless they go to the set. Mm -hmm. Or they can't go to Narnia through the wardrobe, although they may try. So I thought, Venice, they can go to. And the magical thing is they do. I have got yeah. so many letters from children who said, I made my parents go to Venice with me and I found it all. <laughs> the only thing they always say is they don't find the Isola Segreta, the secret island. And I always say, if you find it, let me know because I don't know where it is. <laughs> So they even have rung at doors because they try to find the characters. And I love to do that from time to time in a book. I still need to do that about mm -hmm. LA. Uh, to really put a, a, a place in where children can go and find mm. places. And I've done the same with Salisbury, a little town in England and the cathedral. And mm -hmm. I have been there and seen how the kids walk into the cathedral and suddenly find all the places that I described in the book. So to do that with a historical building or a right. city or place, I think it's even more magical than that than just inventing a world. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Yes. I have to say, I kind of um, I feel that too. I mean, I with your books, I don't consider them so much as fantasy, but more of what our world is if we just noticed the beauty of it a little bit very, more and we're being aware of that. Yeah, that I always say yeah. that when people say, oh, fantasy, that's escape. First of all, that's so, totally nonsense because mm -hmm. I think it's far more realistic because our world is so fantastic in many yeah. ways. Yes, but I always try to sing the love song of this world with all its mm -hmm. terror and all its beauty. Yes. Because, you know, the, the older you get, the more you really discover it everywhere that it just takes your breath away. And um, sadly, we cannot often travel, you know, through wardrobes or other things. So No. <laughs> or go to Hogwarts. <laughs> or go to Hogwarts. Exactly, exactly. And, of course, it's magical to also do that, to, to take all the spices of our world and then discover something new and make it up with our imagination. But I think the best worlds and hogwarts is another example are very close to our reality mm -hmm. you know as is for example the lord of the rings that it, it the, or philip pullman's worlds they are very at home in in this world you almost can touch and feel them and i think that's very important absolutely mm -hmm. so some uh, that's just something i see that in in all your works right from Incard and and it's just a recurring theme and and your approach to writing I feel like yes so that, that, that's how I <laughs> yes I think for example with with reckless um you know reckless is a series where every book is about based on the fairy tales of a yes. certain country mm -hmm. and that shows how international I became in my life I had to travel for my books I suddenly met my Russian readers my readers in New Zealand um, and I thought. I want to write something that they all find their places in that series. Mm -hmm. And at some point they feel that I honor the countries they come from and the internationality of storytelling. So that is for me still the most exciting journey to then say, I, I'm just working on the edit of the fourth one and it's set in Japan and in, Russia and in Italy and many places. And to then read the fairy tales from that world and travel with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, for the first time, it also goes into the mirror world in America. So um, it is quite an adventure, yes. What else inspires you besides the sense of place and scenery and capturing that this part of that world, of our world? Yeah, place as one hero, I can only highly, highly recommend that to all storytellers. Mm -hmm. And then um, what inspires me is really everyday life. What I also find very inspiring that I by now always write my first draft by hand in a notebook. Whoa. So, so yeah, I well, no, of course I was not clever enough to put one here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, but I draw into them and I write everything by hand, the first draft and um, sketch and in a way create it. And then the notebook is almost like a treasure itself and an inspiration to go deeper and deeper into that world. And I always in readings recommend that to young writers and say, 
you may think now, oh, she's just so very old. That's why she says this. But you should oh, use, no. use the computer for the first draft. You know, and, and really no, makes that your hand so playful and it, <laughs> so aware. This is not yet the printed version. You're so beginning mm -hmm. that I can only highly recommend that. And I, by now, I think I have convinced many young writers to do it that way. And then that feeling that all your mm. ideas are suddenly like notebooks on your shelf is also a very enticing and exciting thing. Are there special pens? <laughs> no, yes, but you not not constantly lose. I think every writer knows that feeling. So now I started to not buy myself the expensive, crazy expensive Mont Blanc pens, although I love them because mm -hmm. I just use them. So I try to buy bamboo pens or whatever, but yes, mm -hmm. no plastic if possible. And I try to, you know, as always have a whole bunch of uh, pencils, colored pencils with me to Ooh. underline things. And uh, they are always close and in my bag and always a notebook to travel with. So yes, that's a wonderful thing. Oh, we're so excited. <laughs> Cornelia, I loved how you use the word storyteller and you mm -hmm. yourself call yourself a storyteller, not an author. Yes. Can you give us some insight of what a typical day of a storyteller is like? Well, it, it, it changed a lot over my life. So let's say when my children were young, I always mm -hmm. did the storytelling the moment they left the house or they were with their friends to be a mother when they are there and not miss those years. And I have to say that that was a very good strategy. But now, as they're both grown up and I live on a big farm, what I do in the morning is, first of all, I'm an ob obsessive breakfaster. So I have a year, mm. an hour of breakfast with a book. That is the first and ultimate morning treat, okay? I'm at the moment reading The Songs of Trees by David Haskell, oh. which is mm. unforgettable. So, so espresso, breakfast, if possible, my own tomatoes or whatever, and a book. That is the beginning of the day. And okay. then mostly I walk over to my ducks and my donkeys and feed them. And and uh, bring a get and walk with my dogs over the grounds and pick maybe some avocados and start the day. Then as I still have a lot of European publishers and fans, I have to look into my emails because mm -hmm. they will soon go to bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are so many hours behind. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, answer those, fuck the dogs. And then I usually take my notebook or my computer, if I'm already in a second or third draft, and go into whatever area I decide to work at. As I mostly work outside, that is always like, hmm, do I sit on the porch today? Or do I sit under the trees? Mm -hmm. And I have an artist in residence program here on my farm. So I mostly meet Adolfo Cordova, who's a Mexican writer, or I see uh, his wife, Mariela, who's a photographer taking photos that she uses for her stories. So it is mostly also a mix of encounters during the day. And then my dogs, Jake and Tabby would of course say, and then in between, <laughs> we try to make her make sure that she deals with us. Mm -hmm. um, but it has, since my children are grown and I'm, you could say a free woman, <laughs> um, wild and magical mix of a day most of the time. So I can <laughs> improvise it and I actually really love that. That if I feel like I want to write in the afternoon, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. I also mm -hmm. paint and illustrate a lot. So I do that often in the evening. But yeah. And then sadly, you know, as writers are often so word poisoned in the evening that they can only watch a TV show and will not read it. <laughs> 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 that can happen too. Just describing your day was a story in itself. You I are know. a storyteller. <laughs> I think, you know, if we are all um, looking at our lives, come on, every day is a story. Right? Mm -hmm. And we have yes. to try to tell many good ones. There will always be a few bad ones amongst them. Mm -hmm. Right? And it, it is every, if you, if you compare our lives to a book, there will be chapters that are very low key. And then there are the action chapters, but we can't have them every day. <laughs> In a way, we have to slowly build our own story. And I also really believe that in many ways, we are the storytellers of our own story. You know, that sometimes, okay. yes, like it happens to every storyteller. There are events that do tell us what to write the next time. 
I am not the master of my stories at all. I never know how they end. Oh, yeah. I never know where they're going. They constantly surprise me. I've just been through the, I think the fifth draft of Reckless Four. Okay. And I had to rewrite at least 10 chapters completely because they had tricked me. My characters constantly lied to me, sent me in the wrong direction. I compare it to a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. Every story is like a maze. And you walk in and you try to find the truth and the story is hiding. <laughs> you go in the wrong direction, make you run into the hedges. That's what people call the writer's block. It's not true, it's just the hedge. You the hedge. Okay. You know, you look again, you find <laughs> golden things in the just meant to trick you. And and with this book, it's another one that tricked me so painfully. Really? Oh my god. God, it chased mm. me around that, that I now had to change such massive amounts of things. And then it is such a feeling of happiness when you do see, oh, you tricked me there, but I found it. <laughs> and now I know what the truth about the story is. So, yeah, very exciting. <laughs> so it's a process where these characters reveal oh. themselves to you. Yes. Yes, and, and yeah. I think the most dangerous thing for a writer is to mm -hmm. say this book is done, whether the publisher pushes or mm -hmm. someone, when you know there's still a draft waiting. Because if that draft is waiting, there are some secrets revealed in it that you don't know about yet, and the story will be shallow at parts, mm -hmm. part, or that some sometimes a few threads are just not connected. And luckily, mm -hmm. I also have a very good German editor who's absolutely strict so she goes mm -hmm. into a silent corner with a book for three weeks which does not happen in america for example here mm -hmm. be lucky if the editor takes a weekend you know so yeah, yeah it's there in germany it's really fiesta which i really like because mm -hmm. she when she when i get her notes back i always curse her and <laughs> sadly most of the time she's right <laughs> you always need somebody who walks into the story from outside mm -hmm. and stays with distance, you mm -hmm. know? So, yeah. Well, speaking of your European publishers, can you speak a little bit about um, the translation process mm -hmm. and yes. what gets lost? What gets beautifully yeah. translated? What, yeah, what, what are Ten the trial lost. translations of that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and for example, um, one of my most famous translators into English, Anthea Bell, died last year. So she was my voice. Uh, she was already an old lady, but still we all miss her so badly because yeah. Inkart, mm -hmm. she did Inkart, she did Dragon Rider, and it is Anthea's voice. It is also mm -hmm. mine, but you know, mm -hmm. she, she gave it a new, I always say she made it new dresses. She, she gave the German original an English costume. And to now mm -hmm. find a new translator who will do the next Dragon Rider, who will do the right. next card mm -hmm. because you know, I'm working on the sequel uh, of the Ink World. Mm -hmm. To have a distinctly different world, a voice is very tricky. And then to make it even more complicated, uh, when I did the adaptation of Pan's Labyrinth, yes, you know, Guillermo del Toro asked me to. When I did that, <laughs> I knew as a work, you know, I have to show what I do, Guillermo. I can't write in German. So I wrote mm. one in English. And when I realized, oh, actually, I can do this in English by now. And I love oh. English. That was a mm -hmm. big step for me because for the first time, my German mm -hmm. friends had a translated version from me. They mm -hmm. have right. never mm -hmm. heard my, me in a different way. So I was very nervous about that, and I thought, "Oh, they will hate this." You know, it's uh, so. I worked for six weeks on the translation and made mm -hmm. it sound more like me. But now I have the same problem in English. Uh, reckless, mm -hmm. I still write in German. So when I now read the English translation, I'm like, "Oh no, so wrong! I have to work on it." You know, so oh. it, it becomes more and more tricky, and. Actually, the new Dragon Rider I write in English now, and I think that wow. will, that will happen more and more often because I live in an English language country. So, mm -hmm. um, the Color of Revenge, the next Inkart book, is <laughs> in German, but I am already revising the translation massively because now everybody knows my English voice from the phone. Okay. And it's, oh, 
you sound very different in English. Mm -hmm. Translations are wrong. And I'm like, oh, God, yes, it's true. They, they are not my real voice in many ways. Wow. Very close. But mm -hmm. uh, especially with Reckless, although my cousin translated them very well, still he's a mm -hmm. man, for example. And a man's mm -hmm. voice is different than a woman's. So, and we right. so often underestimate that and think, oh, that does not really matter. It's a very good translator. But it mm -hmm. doesn't matter, I think. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, it's often just tiny tweaks that make uh, the voice unique. So sadly, I shot myself into the foot. Now I have to work <laughs> on the English, work on the English <laughs> and write into languages, yes. But when you curse your editor, <laughs> which language is it in? <laughs> it depends. I think by now it's mostly in English and then I have to translate it for her into German. <laughs> I, I saw that I uh, my notebook I have at the moment on the next Dragon Rider. Although I write the original in English, my notebook is a wild mix of German and English mm -hmm. notes. It's a terrible mess. So that's how it is to live in two languages. <laughs> um, actually, you mentioned Pan's Labyrinth, and I was wondering, mm -hmm. um, what's the process like? So Inkart was made into a movie. And then you did Pan's Labyrinth, which was based on a movie that already existed. What were the similarities between the two, or were they completely different processes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. For example, mm -hmm. with Inkart, um, yes, I did. Uh, I did. The studio was really very, very cooperative. So everything that went oh, wrong that's good. is is just a movie process. You know, yeah. you have three hundred and fifty people, and there is different interpretations of everything and some things go wrong because you have other artists interpreting your work. That mm -hmm. will always happen with movie adaptations. So, um, but with Guillermo, the process was completely different because he at some point approached me and said, Cornelio, would you adapt, uh, would you make a novel out of Pants Lemons? And I literally had to sit down because first of all, this is my mm -hmm. favorite movie in the world. It's, yeah. Oh, Guillermo knew that. So the poster had been hanging on the wall for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And just imagine, I'm sure you have a favorite movie. Imagine the maker of that movie would come to you and say, turn this into words, right? Yeah. First of all, you're like, it's impossible. How can you, and, and I'm an illustrator. I have the greatest respect for images. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's impossible. But as in fairy tales, you have to take the impossible task. So <laughs> when he asked, how can you say no to Guillermo de Toro? No. <laughs> you know, right? So I thought, okay, you will fail, but it will be an honorable failure and you mm -hmm. will not be a coward, so you will have done it. So I had one dinner with him, a very long dinner, where we ate a giant crab, actually, and I said, <laughs> oh, in my writing house. That and sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> to me. That's the perfect food right? to be eating when you're talking about that movie. <laughs> and I had, I had one page of questions okay. where I thought if, if all these questions, I have the right answer, then I understand how he thinks and then I understand how his characters think because I will have to mm -hmm. add the thoughts. I have to interpret scenes because I was determined to not change one beat of the story. So... I asked him, for example, when the fascist puts his razor on his throat, is he flirting with death? Is, and he, and Guillermo just smiled and nodded. And I knew, okay, okay. I understand it the right way. I decipher it the right way. It will not feel strange mm. to me when I write it. The next mm. thing was that he was very disappointed when I told him I will not change anything. He said like, no, I want you to play. I said, no, I will not play. It's my holy grail. It's the sacred <laughs> I will not play. Every dialogue will be the same. Every beat, every gesture, I will copy everything and write it that way. And so I will describe the images I see. I will not change one beat. And he looked like a child whom you had told Christmas is over, okay? So I thought, oh my God, what do I do? I don't want him to be disappointed. So mm -hmm. I suggested that I do 10 short stories and I mm -hmm. add them to the book and I make up stories about key elements of the movie. And he said, oh, interludes. And I said, yes, interludes. <laughs> <laughs> Love that idea. And that worked, I think, really well 
because I could make them up. We could pretend they are from Ophelia's books. They didn't even have to be like what Guillermo thought is true mm -hmm. about the backstory. Mm -hmm. But he didn't, he did give me a few notes on the book, really insightful and beautiful notes, but he did not give me one note on the stories because he really loved them. So uh, then I had to, of course, go through and edit because I had written in English. So I asked mm -hmm. Emma Dryden, who's a very brilliant independent editor, mm -hmm. and very, very strict. And we went together through, yes, fire and ice to get that book done. <laughs> and, uh, wow. But I have to say, to then I read it in England when it was launched uh, after they had shown the movie. So we always did an interview after the movie. So I walked in when they saw the last images and then we talked about the process and to see that the movie and the words can hold up against each other and that I did justice to that movie. Mm. That is one of, the, mm -hmm. one of the greatest adventures I ever had. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I love how you took the challenge of it too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not no. Right? One cannot say no to that. That you would regret that on your deathbed. That is yes. to, to you know and to get that trust from somebody whom you admire. For me, he's one of the greatest storytellers mm -hmm. of all time. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was just, I, I was so sure it would be disastrous. But to then hear, oh my God, now I can look at the movie because the book gives me the trust that I can look at the horror in it. You know, mm -hmm. or, or that I heard from people, oh, now I understand the characters better. And when Guillermo said that I, in a way, completed his universe, I knew, okay, mm -hmm. that was done. But I, I don't think I would do it for any other movie in the world. You know, it was oh, that. Yeah. Movie. Okay. And, and it, it was also wonderful to, for a change, not have to think about plotting. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I focus on language, you know, okay. and say it, it, that was really beautiful. Like you paint a portrait, you know what you paint. Uh -huh. and you only have to think about your colors. You know, you don't have to come up and invent something like you often have to. So, I'm just sorry. I was just checking our chat. I'm wondering if um, everyone's just like us are getting caught up with your story. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I, I know I am. <laughs> questions, right? So I just wanted to remind everyone who is watching over there here in the live stream. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in and we will incorporate them into our conversation as much yes. as we can. Yes, we're, we're watching for the comments. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sometimes you have that. It's like the same in reading. Sometimes you, you have a hundred fingers going up and sometimes everybody's very shy. So, yeah. No, I think it's just your storytelling and everyone oh. is just, I know, it's just because your <laughs> pictures with your words is just amazing. <laughs> we have to do this again live. So we have to promise each other we will repeat this live. Yes, right? absolutely. We absolutely have to, you know, once we are allowed to do that again. You know, we, we actually do have a question. Yes, um, yes. We've agreed. Such great stories. Um, mm -hmm. we, this comment wasn't it what are you working on next oh yes what's coming okay. what's on the pop pipeline Ooh, so yes, i am somebody who always works on three to four books at the same time wow wow and in different stages so i'm at the moment finishing the edit of reckless four which will be okay. called uh on silver tracks or silvery tracks i don't know yet how the translation will be in wow. german it is of silberner fertig uh, and it will take uh, Fox and Jacob and all my heroes to Japan and then uh, to Parja, to America, to the South Carolinas, actually, and uh, and to Europe, to Vienna. So uh, I'm almost done with that. We will have one more grueling draft, my editor and I, and then it will be uh, published in October in German and then next year in English. And for the first mm -hmm. time, the whole Reckless series, because I'm done with self-publishing in America. I've done that because um, Little Brown, my yeah. first publisher, wanted to censor the first book. They wanted me to change the first chapter because it had a birth in it. And mm -hmm. as I had already published the book to great acclaim in Germany, I said, the book is a book. I will not change it, which made me a self-publishing author. 
So all the reckless books came under my label, but as I'm really, in, I don't have the time to do it. I now gave all the rights to Pushkin Press in uh, in England, mm -hmm. wonderful publisher, and they will do the American re-release next year. And then also the fourth book. So the whole Mirror World series finally has a good home. Uh, that, that will be done, I would say, end of July. Then I have to illustrate it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that brings us to August. Then I will go back into Dragon Rider 3, which is set actually in Malibu. Okay. And I have already 16 chapters and there are 10 more left. So you don't have to go very far to research Malibu. <laughs> <laughs> that was so hard. I love to, to, to set a fantasy tale about a huge creature coming from the ocean into, into a, a very busy area of the world, mm -hmm. not far away from humans. That is an interesting mm -hmm. challenge and I so far love it. And I write that one in English, so it will come out next year in English also. Oh, that's exciting. And then, of course, we just did a wild thing that did not happen in English yet. Because mm -hmm. of the coronavirus crisis and all my mm. readings being so sad often, I asked yeah. on Twitter, what do you want me to do? So there were two requests. One was, tell us what happened to Maggie and Marvel. Mm. and Dustinger. And the other one was, tell us what happened with the wild chicks. So now I have to explain mm. one thing about the wild chicks. That's a series of books that only was published in German and Spanish so far and under my publishing company in, in America. And it's about a gang of girls fighting a gang of boys. Gang, not in the way we know it by now. They are quite, which is not a, they, they, they can be mean to each other, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So that gets so famous in Germany that at some point there were 300 registered wild chick gangs in Germany, all wearing chicken yeah. feathers. And fathers, <laughs> because the main hero has red hair and all the girls were coloring the hair red and wanted, wanted chicken. So that is 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So they wanted to know, what do the girls do now? So they're 30. So I'm working at the moment with a friend of mine on a script about their wild chicks when they are 30. And that mm -hmm. is the To find out, where, you know, to, to say, what happens? I left them when they were 16. What happened with them? So we're doing that when I do that in script form. And then the other request was, what about Maggie and Mo? So. Yes, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have 16, 16 chapters written of a book called The Color of Revenge. And that is an ink hot book and set five Ooh. years after ink death. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, Cornelia, do a crazy thing. You are very happy with these chapters. Mm -hmm. Release them, although the book is not done. So we do that now in Germany that every second week, an actor reads one chapter from The Color of Revenge. Oh. And the same will happen now in Spanish. So the English translation, here we are at the translation problem once again. <laughs> yeah. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. translation, but it is mm -hmm. still in my voice. So mm -hmm. I decided, as it is such an important book, that once I'm done with Reckless, I will polish the translation, mm -hmm. and then we will do the same in English. I will release online 14 chapters of The Color of Revenge, read by a narrator and then everybody has to wait a year to hear how it ends because the oh, book. No. <laughs> so it's a bit of torture and a bit of a present to my readers you know and i hope it's not too crazy because some things may still <laughs> change while i'm working on the book that's true but yeah. you will learn about what maggie's doing you will learn about what mm -hmm. dustin is doing all my characters mm -hmm. are back and uh it will be about the power of the image against the power of the world Mm -hmm. So, wow! That's what I'm working on. Oh, yes, and I, I finished a picture book about mm -hmm. death, which I did actually for children's hospice. Many mm -hmm. years ago. it's called the bridge, and it's a story about the bridge of death and about an angel who wants to bring those over who were wait at the other side. It was a very strange thing to work on that, and mm -hmm. then the epidemic happened, and and I can imagine it was very interesting that I was painting these images about the other side and, 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 uh, 
and dealing with a story that addresses that at these times. So my German publisher said that we want to do this picture book, we want to do it now. And it's the first mm -hmm. time illustrations with oil. So uh, we are scanning them at the moment and getting them ready and that book will be published next. Let's see, I hope I will find an American publisher. Wow. So, yeah. Well, there's are, there are more questions in chat, but I do want to talk about more about your your illustrations and your art or your art and your yeah. painting. Can can you speak about that side about uh, of your yes. creative life? Yeah, I started as an illustrator, which, which most people don't know. Um, I started as an illustrator and I was such a bored illustrator because I always had to draw children in classrooms, children in kitchens. Mm. And I, I never had to do fantasy that most of the stories in Germany at that mm. time were mm -hmm. social realism, as you call it. Mm -hmm. So one night I sat down and said, okay, I'm done. I'm gonna write a story myself and put everything in I want to draw. But mm -hmm. I didn't see myself as a writer. I still saw myself as an illustrator. It took me several books to realize, oh, oh, you do the writer writing quite seriously too. So then, <laughs> as I can be quite extreme in my passions, I was like, okay, I'm a writer now. I'm not an illustrator anymore. I'm gonna do the illustrations for my own books, but you know, that's not important. <laughs> it, and it took me many, many years to get back to the illustration and say, actually, mm -hmm. I now draw a character first and then I write about them. That is wow. Yes, I, I very often do that by now, and I have to say I enjoy that very much. So, for example, there is one main character in the new Reckless book um, who is a Japanese wrestler, and mm -hmm. he, he has tattoos of all the stories of his life on his body. So, he's uh, a Hideo, and Hideo, I first did a big painting of him, and then there is an elf in the book who likes to show himself as a centaur so i painted the centaur and i was like oh i thought you looked quite different i'm so that's such a surprise so i had no idea <laughs> as a centaur but the illustration showed me and that's why for, for here for the artists in residence it's very interesting mm -hmm. to have young illustrators here who mm -hmm. in a way inspire me to look at my mm -hmm. my stories in a different way because they all came here because they did illustrations for Reckless. So. Wow. Yes. Oh, yeah, so. Two uh, Italian illustrators who come and they did mm -hmm. illustrations for the film. So before this interview, um, we were talking about your artist in resident mm -hmm. yes. program or what, what do you call it? Just. <laughs> I, I think an artist in resident <laughs> is probably mm -hmm. what it is. So I invite I would say between 20 and 25 artists a year um, to stay in one of my little houses. I have an old barn. I have tiny houses on my property. So, mm -hmm. and uh, one is called the cricket. That is the tiniest one. I have the owl and I have the avocado house. And all <laughs> have little parts of the property. And uh, I love it when in each one there's another artist. And then we all gather either in the garage where we all paint or somewhere in the garden. We have California weather, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, to see what comes out of these collaborations already, how each one inspires the other. Mm -hmm. I'm already working on two picture book program, uh, projects with two different illustrators now. Mm -hmm. um, I have another uh, friend who is a musician who suddenly does music to one of the animation movies that, that were created here. So. It shows once again what I really believe in that artists mm -hmm. work together, create mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. incredible things, and that it's not the lonely artist sitting somewhere. Mm -mm. There's always mm -hmm. new things, and there are all the, always other inspirations. And especially we in the picture book market, in the children's book market, mm -hmm. luckily can still convince um, publishers to illustrate. You know, it's sadly, it is a tradition that you don't find in grown up books much anymore. In the 19th century, every book was illustrated. And now it's mm -hmm. only children's books. So, but luckily we still have that. So this oh. actually leads into the latest question that was asked um, and, and a previous question. So mm -hmm. the first part is, do you work in the same physical space for writing and illustrating? And in a larger sense, um, mm -hmm. we had a question, please tell us more about your farm. <laughs> so, um, no. I, 
I usually write, um, I have a porch behind my bedroom, which is like, you, you have to imagine, it's like an old ranch house. It's one okay. level with a porch that goes around. It looks a little bit like a ship that landed between the avocado trees. It's not a big house. But so when I have four artists here and we all like cooking and baking and sitting together or watching movies, I am in the other on the other half of the house so that the girls or whoever is here feel they can even watch a movie in my living room without disturbing me. So mm. I said I have my own writing area on the other side on the, in the, of the house on a porch outside under an avocado tree, of course. And <laughs> uh, I go for painting and illustrating into my garage because all okay. the materials are in there. And often one of the artists is working there as well, which I love. So there mm -hmm. are three easels in there, several tables. And I put a glass door into the garage so that we have enough light. Uh, when I first found this farm, I thought, oh, it's so wrong because the house is small. When you work at home, it's it's not ideal. It's an old house from 1956 for LA standards. And uh, the barn is by now my guest house for artists who need a little space, like the marionette makers, the printers, mm -hmm. the musicians. They always go into the barn. Mm -hmm. And I love how it changes with every artist who come. Um, but uh, often then we have a tiny studio underneath the porch where you can do stop motion and pottery. And um, so you could say you find me in another place almost every day. <laughs> but I work by now on my porch mm -hmm. under the tree. So it's my favorite place at the moment. Oh, oh, that's wow. wonderful. I have to do a shout out to one of my book club members. One of my book club members <laughs> is in the chat. And, yeah. he, asked, and he asked, what is your favorite book? What Sorry? <laughs> what my is dogs your... are barking. I love it. I love it because it adds to the whole surrounding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if we ever doubted that you were, in the, you were on a farm. Yes, yes. I'm not lying about the farm. This confirms it. <laughs> Here they go. I'm sure they're seeing this girl or the wild parrots that are landing right now in my a tree. And I have huge owls, but they luckily only screech at night. So, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yes. So one of my book club members asked, what is your favorite book? Mm. Of, of the ones I wrote or the ones others wrote? Let's do both. The, of yeah. yours and your, just your favorite book. My favorite book of other writers. Can I say three? Okay. Yes. Is um, The One Time Future King by T.H. White. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Pr uh, Princess Bride by William Goldman. Oh, yeah. Oh, and Tom Sawyer <laughs> by Mark Twain. If I had mm. to name also... Uh, so-called grown-up book, it was The East of Eden by John Sandek. Oh, nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, of my own. Yes. Very hard. Well, that's hard. Because mm -hmm. the others would get very upset. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> children. But I have a few secret favorites who never got that famous. And oh. two of those are Igraine the Brave. Oh, I love that book. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, with the talking books. It, it's like... One of my all-time favorites, <laughs> and um, and the Pirate Pig. Oh, which, oh yeah, yeah. You know, which is a one that you can read aloud so well, and I love the illustrations by Kristen Meyer. So yeah, those mm -hmm. are two of my. And then when Santa fell from Earth, from from Heaven, oh, yes. sky, and that's the English one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from the sky. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, great! Thank you. And, and I agree the brave is famous with us. Yes, but I couldn't tell. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love that book. It's so yeah. funny. Our parents are oh. magicians. Books are taught. Yeah. I, I, love, I love that book. <laughs> yeah, we always try to do it, make it into an animation movie because that would really lend itself. And right. we actually now have a wonderful script. So I have two friends who try to produce and get it done. Mm -hmm. But let's see. You know, the script is wonderful. But uh, yeah. Maybe in the future. Okay. Maybe, Maybe in the exactly. <laughs> All right. Oh, I feel like we have to get to this question from Anna Montenegro, who is Mel on ah. Twitter and sends you a big hug. Oh, Mel, well, of course. Hi, Mel. <laughs> oh, I'm I so hope she's still awake because it is 1 a.m. in Spain and she's watching <laughs> this interview before going to bed. Um, oh, it's so nice. Ask yes. You, 
Now she's um, I've learned yeah. from her so many things about my own characters, and she's oh, so yeah. passionate, especially about the inkwell, inkwell that it's uh, you know it's wonderful. I have to say for that I love social media to hear okay. from your readers and to then feel the excitement grow when your books are coming and to oh, also what do you want to hear about. You know, because you may at some point forget about certain aspects. Luckily, I also have a daughter who is 30 years old and always is my first editor and is very strict and says, Mom, tell me more about that. And why did you not talk about that? So <laughs> for me, that is a very, very important thing. And uh, so, yes. Hi, Mel. Oh, well, she also wanted to ask if she can be the prince's golden yarn. Oh, and thanks oh. so much. That's what does that mean? <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> she talked about the Black Prince. I need to write oh, one. Oh, okay. Just about the Black Prince for mm -hmm. my. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. There's your question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a great question. May I ask, mm -hmm. do you have a memorable fan or fan letter and what made them special? Yes, there is um, the one that was very, very important. Um, after I had published this, The Thief Lord, um, a reader wrote me that she loves the book, but why is there only one girl? Mm. And I still remember I sat down and I thought, why is there only one girl? Is it that the girls are so obsessed with boys that they even write about them all the time? Why did you as a female writer not put more work, girls in there. And I felt very good. So mm -hmm. I said to that reader, I promise you, the next hero will be a girl. And that made Maggie happen. Oh, so wow. it was a very, very influential mm -hmm. fan letter. You know, and there are always encounters and, and letters, especially when they tell you that you got them through a rough time with your books. You know, that, that makes you always aware of how important storytelling is. And I always say that in events to young writers. Don't think you just do this for money. Don't think you just do this because you're obsessed with your own stories. Uh, you know, do this because you are the word fisher man in a way for the others. Mm -hmm. You have to find the words for those who don't have words. It's a very important task and a serious one. When you have readers coming to you say, this got me through cancer. Or my dying child read Dragon Rider three times. When you have heard these, or I got a letter from a female uh, soldier in Iraq who said to me, Cornelia, I only survived the sand because of Inca death. That reminds you that you have to take your task serious. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know? So, yes, I've been a lot of influential letters. Thank you, Blue Green 555, for that great question. Yes. That, was, that was a great yes. question. Yes. Well, it's just this amazing community that develops, right? From your yes. books, the people reading yes. your works, the, the fellow creators and it, illustrators. It, yes, it is such a, it, it's such a meaningful crowd. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I hope the readers know how important they are for the author because it's really that you, you write about a world, you describe it, you tell the fates of the characters. You don't want to tell that to just yourself. To, to have that feeling that suddenly thousands are walking in that world, talking in that world, listening in that world, that makes our books come alive. And that's not just yeah. something that is said to be nice. That is the truth. That's why it is, of course, exciting to suddenly hear. I remember I was in India and um, I had um, Indian teenagers lining up. They were in their early, well, not even teenagers, they were in their 20s. And they all said, can I hug you? You're my childhood. <gasps> so now you, I wrote those books still in Germany that they could reach children in India with such a different mm -hmm. reality. You know? Or I went, mm -hmm. once walked into a hall in New Zealand and there were 2,000 teenagers who knew every beat of, of my books and the same in Mexico. That is such a magical thing to know. It's all a huge community and we all travel with story and I had my stories you know I traveled with the Lord of the Rings a dozen times I was my yeah. who is with Tom Sawyer you know I read the Harry Potter books to my children so I all these stories that touch humans so uh, profoundly 
Mm -hmm. And suddenly see that your story does the same, that is, of course, quite a magical thing. I was just wondering, have there any been, have there been any readers who made you realize something about your own work or mm. something that about or about a character? Oh yes, it happens all the time. It 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 mm. even happens with very good journalists. You know, sometimes mm. very good journalists see a layer. For example, I once had a journalist in Germany. Um, I grew up in an area of Germany that is a very strange mix of heavily industrial and have and very rural. So mm -hmm. my childhood memories was, here's a meadow with cows, and behind it, I see the factories. That was, for me, a very normal contrast. Okay. So that journalist said to me, well, so in Reckless, that's the landscapes of your childhood. And I had not. Ah, wow. So I mm -hmm. sat there, you know, dumb bolded, mm -hmm. like, and I thought, <laughs> and, and, and that is so magical when a journalist or an, a fan or mm -hmm. a, you know, tell you something that you were blind to. And it's like certain elements and in, in figures. You know, I always knew that Jacob Reckless would not exist without my son because the recklessness he has and his approach to fear, I, I only met that when I had a son. You know, when wow. you an 11 year old do a back double flip for, off your roof and you realize you just entered a new. And, and uh, I still remember him reading Reckless, although he never reads books because he prefers a skateboard and making music. But when he read Reckless, because he knows he's in it, he, I still remember him saying afterwards, well, mom, yeah, okay, you told all the bad things about me. And he said, oh, but as you told also the good things about me, I'm fine. So it's interesting how you sometimes, you know, I'm sure some fans find their footprints in the in the books at some point, or there's a name mm. of somebody who meant something in your life. So there are, of course, all these echoes in books. And I love the idea to, to have a fan realize, I told her that, about that character. With the wild chicks, I once had it that a girl said to me, I want to meet Charlotte's father because Charlotte didn't know about her father. Her mother was mm. a dr cab driver and didn't want to know about the father either. So there's a girl who is 12 years old and doesn't know. And there's a reader who says, I want to meet him. So in the next sequel, I had the father appear. You know, so, so mm. these things happen. And I think that's a wonderful collaboration between readers and authors. <laughs> These books really paved the way for that mm -hmm. conversation and for that relationship to happen. Yes, yes. But and, and I think you have to accept that you're not a storyteller who's like, oh my God, I can do this, the others can't. You have to say, no, it's my task to do this. Mm. You know, and the others will contribute and tell me what to talk about. But I do this for the others and not to talk about you know my inner life or whatever that will make its way into the books anyway but mm -hmm. it's not, it not a narcissistic endeavor everybody who wants to be a writer to just talk about himself or herself i say please don't you know we don't need more books of those that kind <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, and, and, you know, of course i don't mean people who write about a fate they had where they think they can show others something about a certain reality. That, mm. is, that is a totally different thing. But there are, as we all know, there are self-obsessed people as we are a self-obsessed culture. Now, mm -hmm. where they misunderstand what writing should be about. So we're coming into mm -hmm. our final few minutes for anyone who has any last one questions. I think on that vein, are there other tips that you can offer well, there's Writers the one thing, there. you know, and, and, uh, uh, that now, uh, I, yes, never write your first draft on a computer. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Always, the, the computer will fool you and tell you it looks already like it's printed. It looks already like it's done. So always have a notebook, an A4, like a big one, so you can line things out. Always just write on the right page and so that mm -hmm. you can line out, glue things in, put photos mm -hmm. and and whatever you feel inspires you, your thoughts, inter write a chapter, then write a few pages full of questions for the next chapter. 
thousands of things you should do. And uh, I think you will love those notebooks so much mm -hmm. and you will get addicted to it. Is that what you have? You have the notebooks of all your first drafts? Yes, I have by, uh, by now 90 and I have them all in fireproof boxes because I live in Malibu. Wow. Mm -hmm. but, but, and some of them are just so beautiful. So I have to get them out and put them on my shelves. And I have the piles everywhere in the house. And I think everybody will get addicted to that once you start that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the second, when you write, when you type, what you've written by hand mm -hmm. into the computer. Mm -hmm. You may already do your second draft mm -hmm. because you will change so much that you're already starting, you know, and, and to edit. And I think that's a beautiful process. And then, of course, the computer is an immensely helpful tool. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. All right. Let's take a look. Lauren, which of these questions should we cover next in these oh, final few minutes? So many great questions. I, I know there's not them all. <laughs> oh, this one, this can be answered. When is the crossover between the Ink World and oh, yes. Mirror World slated to be released in English? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, the crossover will be is already happening. So if you mm -hmm. if you read Reckless, you will find certain motives. Like, okay. for example, that Jacob looked for a carousel once that makes you young or old, which is a crossover with Thief Lord. Um, and that you will find certain crossovers with All My World. Mm -hmm. um, there is also, there are several stories published already. I think one is on my website. I will check with my sister. It's called The Silver Book. And uh, that already shows um, how the books originally were the portal to go from one world to the other. And mm -hmm. then, the, the mirror, then the mirrors became far more important. So, but it's the same maker who made the silver book and who made the mirrors. And Ooh. Ink World is 500 years younger than Reckless. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> in the same world, and it's 500 years later. And from time to time, Fox and Jacob will find things that hint at, okay, you know, and, and in, in the fourth book, there will be the mention of fire dancers on an island and, and people put it together. There's a Martin in one, hid, I hid a Martin in one of the others. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I just hide breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, but the, in The Color of Revenge, the next ink book, which hopefully, uh, I think it will not come out in English next year. I, I think it will be okay. a year later. Mm -hmm. uh, the Color of Revenge, but you will get the chapters. I will still do that, the first 14 chapters. That is a crossover because it will, first of all, uh, talk about the world outside of Fenolio's realm. So if Fenolio thinks he controls that world. He already got rid of that illusion a little bit. Mm -hmm. But in the color of revenge, it will show there's a very different kind of magic in that world. There are witches in that world. There are all the realities you know from Reckless. And that you can weave another kind of magic, which Orpheus uses to take revenge. And you will also meet, um, oh God, the alders, the silver alders, the, the trees in which the elves will bend. You will meet those in Ink World now too. And all these motives will slowly fill in so that you will both in the regular series and in the color of revenge will find those motives. And, oh, I forgot, there's one little, um, a book called, um, which is only published in English so far, in England so far. It's called The Glass of Lead and Gold. And that is a story set in London behind the mirrors with a totally different set of heroes. And I think there are a few hints in there. Wow. I can't so wait. We, I know. And also when we can travel again, now I have to go to England. <laughs> But I think Pushkin, that book. Press, well, Pushkin Press hopefully delivers that book. I, I really <laughs> loved it because um, um, Adam Freudenheim, who does Pushkin Press, asked me to write a Christmas story set in London. My daughter lived for seven years in London, so I know it very, very well. And set it behind the mirrors. And that was so much fun. So, yeah. So, yeah. It's a little yeah, we book. Just... <laughs> Well, we just got a lot of excited people listening to that oh, yeah. and hearing that news in chat. Yes. Um, most notably, um, someone commented how you just, it was wonderful how you weaved all those stories together. Mm -hmm. And it's 
pretty much very much what, what, what happened this whole hour. It was just very magical way of you weaving in your inspiration, your stories, your surroundings, your life now. And I uh, just wanted to thank you again for, for sharing this hour with us. It's all about the weaving. And you know, we did one thing during the quarantine when it started, we, I, I, I tied a ribbon to the wall and I can only mm -hmm. highly recommend it to you all to do it that way. Okay. Every single day, each one of us here picked a color of a yarn and hung one piece of yarn onto that ribbon. So now we have a tapestry right now. Oh. Of different colors of yarn. And suddenly the quarantine time became this carpet and this tapestry of yarns and weavings. Sometimes we mm -hmm. do braids, sometimes we hang them loose. We did special yarns for special days. And when the wind plays with them, they start dancing so that we all said, oh, we want to do that from now on every day, a yarn for every day. So start collecting different kinds of yarns and hang them up. I tell you, it's endless fun. <sighs> That's such great advice. It is. It's just so much fun. And it reminds us all that life is like that, you know, woven from different yarns and from different colors. And it makes you very aware of it when you then see the whole tapestry. You so really work, work in images. You just yeah. work <laughs> in images. And, story <laughs> and storyteller. And storyteller. Well, thank you again. And I, I love that. We are left with the advice of how to turn this time into a tapestry. Yes. Thank you so much, Cornelia. Well, Lauren, thank, you, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Everyone who's reading and watching online, um, please feel free to subscribe to our channel or follow us for more news on any other upcoming live events. We have a wonderful summer coming in. Summer reading program is starting on Monday. Lauren, right. you have a ton of stuff going on, right? You, some more oh, author yes. talks. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Uh, I wasn't ready for that, but the <laughs> one thing that, that I, can, I, can, I can say is tomorrow I'm going to be talking to Tay Keller when you trap a tiger. Wow. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. She's fabulous. The book's fabulous. Mm -hmm. So that, that's all I can oh. think of right now. <laughs> We and do we, get a we, lot of comments. We, oh. we do a promise today, holy promise, that we will do this again live. Oh, Absolutely. yes. We did yes. get a lot of requests for that, too. So, okay, everyone. The, uh, a moment yes. we are allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will work on it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time and generosity for offering this. And thank you, everyone watching, for joining us today and all your questions. Oh, yes. We will see you next time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.